Well, if he stays like this, it will be one of the great wins. They were afraid of losing, so they changed their tactics. That was a completely different game that they'd played for 90 minutes. Unbelievable. Fear of losing can take one's eye off the desired goal. Fear of losing causes us to be reactive rather than proactive. Life is so much nicer when we're proactive, isn't it? It's harder, though. You have to plan. You have to look ahead. Whether we focus on our fear or our goal really makes the difference between simply surviving and really thriving. Henry David Thoreau wisely said, Most people live lives of quiet desperation and go to the grave with the song still in them. Don't leave your song inside. Here's an example from God's kingdom. The rich young ruler was playing not to lose, and you know his story. It's in Mark 10, 17 to 27. And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. This is critical, this next sentence. And Jesus, looking at him, and in my mind, knowing him, loved him, and said to him, you lack one thing. That wasn't a collective you, the world you, the rich people you. That was you, single person, that I know intimately, you lack one thing. Parentheses, and Jesus says, and I know exactly what it is. Go sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. Jesus told him to do the one thing that he couldn't quite do. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. That young man had much, but he knew there was more. He knew the more was found in Jesus. But, there's another but, he was not willing to risk the good for the great. He clutched to the good, like most of us do, like all of us do at some point, maybe every day, clinging to the good, because we don't want to let go of that and then cross this chasm of the ugly zone to try and get the great, right? He went away with his song still inside. He was not willing to offer his body as a living sacrifice. He was playing not to lose. Can you catch that? All right, so here it is, in defense of playing offense. I just love that term, in defense of playing offense. Ron, you should write a book about that. Playing to win means becoming comfortable with uncertainty. It's easy for me to say. For many people, these are uncertain times. If we allow the external factors to decide our certainty, we feel powerless to control situations. We're like a boat being tossed about on the high seas with no rudder to guide us. When we shift our beliefs to say... I am certain I can succeed no matter what because I know what my priorities are and I know God wants me to succeed, catch this, as his ambassador. He wants me to succeed within his definition of success, which is pretty much more awesome than I could ever think of, right? We now have a rudder to steer our boat no matter what situations threaten to toss us around. We enjoy an internal certainty bolstered by the Holy Spirit that cannot be rocked no matter what is happening in the outside world. It is so much more fun to actually, and actually easier and more fulfilling when we play to win at the game of life versus playing not to lose. By the way, from in this particular instance, 
teacher to class. I don't like that, but taking notes is a really good idea. Because <laughs> who's, who's got a photographic memory in here? That's why when, when I give a uh, message, um, my sermon notes contain more notes for you guys to take home because some of it, much of it just gets lost. So take notes. We read in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control. Even Paul uses uh -uh, sports analogies, right? Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, you know, a worldly prize. But we, Christians, an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly, Paul says. I have a goal. I do not box as one beating the air. But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Paul is saying, if you're in the race, race to win. The catch here is that we're all in the race. We've been put there. You cannot extricate yourself from the race. Whether we've chosen to be or not, we're in it, right? Whether we like it or not, we're in the game. God expects us to play to win. Look at what he says to a couple of churches in Revelation. Revelation 3, 1 to 3, To the church in Sardis, and to the angel of the church in Sardis, write, The words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive. Note the word reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Oops. Missed the mark. Dang. I thought I was doing it right. Wake up and straighten it and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. <laughs> Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it. And repent. If you will not wake up, <laughs> snap out of it. I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I come against you. The church in Sardis was playing to have a good reputation. Not to win, but to look good. How often do we play at life just to make a good appearance, but not really to score or win? We deceive ourselves, don't we, when we play for appearances. Jesus is not fooled, and he is not amused. Jonathan Edwards, a pastor, theologian, and key figure in the Great Awakening, which was a spiritual revival in the U.S. in the 18th century, said this, quote, Zeal is spoken of as a very essential part of true religion. It is spoken of as something Christ had in mind for us when he paid for our redemption. We read in Titus 2.14, quote, Who gave himself up for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, some more peculiar than others, zealous of good works, end quote. Still quoting Jonathan Edwards. It was also the essential thing missing from the lukewarm Laodiceans the church in Laodicea, as we're going to read right now. Revelation 3, 15 to 19. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, poor, pitiable, blind, and naked. How'd you like that to be told to you? You think you're this, but here's what you really are. Wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Now let's look at a couple words here. Zealous means ardently active, devoted, diligent, enthusiastic, eager, fervent, fervid, intense, passionate, 
antonyms are apathetic and lackadaisical. So when it comes to our spiritual life, are we ardently active or are we lackadaisical? Think about that. 24-7, our spiritual life, we are spiritual beings, cannot get away from it. You can't shut off the spiritual life and turn it on at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. Many times we think we're playing to win, but we're only treading water. We're lukewarm. To Jesus, that strategy is wholly unacceptable. He, choose, he says, choose a side and get in the game. He looks at us and loves us. He knows best. Remember, okay, that's back to the rich young ruler. He looks at us, knowing us, and he loves us. He knows best what we need. He says he reproves us and disciplines us, and we are to be zealous. God will save the day if we let him. Right? In verse 18 here, he, quote, counsels us to buy from him gold refined by fire. What's that all about? What do you think is the currency that we're to use to buy his gold refined by fire? The currency we use to buy his gold refined by fire is our lives. That's the currency. That's what we pay for that. It is a transaction. We do. We, we give him ourselves. He gives us unbelievable things. Fully committed to him. It's our bodies offered as living sacrifices as we re read in Romans 12. Here's some comments from a woman named Summer Morris of Austin, Texas. Summer has an online blog called You Are the One I Want, Finding Freedom in God's Design. Here's what she says, quote, Most of us are so afraid of these things, making mistakes or losing, that we focus all of our energies on not doing them, and none of us should want to. We should be careful not to ruin the lives God has given us, entrusted to us, by the way. But there's something that's just as dangerous and more subtle that we should be just as afraid of, and that's wasting our lives. Lackadaisical. In fact, still quoting Summer, in fact, wasting your life has the potential to be more destructive because you don't realize it's happened until it's too late. You wake up one day and your life is gone. You might still be able to make something of it, but you won't be able to regain the time you've lost. God hasn't placed you on this earth for the sake of simply avoiding making mistakes. He put you here to do something, something significant, something lasting. The measure of your life isn't in the mistakes you don't make, but in the measurable impact you leave. End quote. In light of these passages and comments, does God expect us to play to win or to play not to lose? To play to win. What kind of a report card would Jesus give us as individuals with respect to our current game plan for our lives? I'm falling woefully short. Think about that for yourself for a moment. Are you playing not to lose or playing to win? Are we focusing on the negative or on the goal, the positive? Thankfully, we have a coach at playing to win. Thankfully, like virtually all other lessons we learn, Jesus goes before us as an example. Beep. Beep. You guys missed that verse. Bummer. Beep. Thankfully, on your outline, there you go. Like virtually all other lessons we learn, Jesus goes before us as an example. He never asks us to do anything that he hasn't already done. Part of the reason that he came to earth as a man, fully man, and fully God at the same time. Don't ask me how that works. Ask Pastor Ron afterwards. All right, Hebrews 12, 1 to 2. Hey. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which so closely, which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, 
who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Lay aside every weight means to not focus on the negative. Lay it aside. Put it away. The challenges, the troubles of this world, put it away. Looking to Jesus in that verse means do focus on his actions and example as our goal. What would Jesus do, right? Our focus should be on winning, not not losing. Here's an example from World War II, which I'm actually going to skip. I, I, I love World War II stuff, but I'm going to skip it because I've been going on too many rabbit trails. Focus was the last point on that. What is our focus? Beep. That on which we focus has an amazing influence over the results we achieve. We can all think of examples in our life that teach us that we create that on which we focus. Catch that? We create, not taking God out of the equation here, but we are part of the equation. We create that on which we focus. Job said, for the thing I greatly feared has come upon me, and what I dreaded has happened to me. I am not at ease, nor am I quiet. I have no rest, for trouble comes. And it did. <laughs> that wasn't Job's fault, per se, but that was a negative mindset. Right? That guy had some bad self-talk going on. Proverbs 23, 7 says, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. We become what we think about, what we focus on, and we attract what we focus on. And did you know that our brains do not hear the negative part of our internal statements? I'm going to give you a couple examples of that. Our brain is playing to win, not playing to lose. We need to focus on the positive using positive statements. Picture, next picture, next slide. Here's an example, sports, from my golf game. This is the tee looking at the green. Like, uh-oh. Uh-oh. So, what are we thinking about here? As an example, okay, I tell myself, don't hit it in the water, right? Our brain does not hear the word don't. My body just proceeds to plink. Oh, what was I thinking? What was I thinking? I create the result on which I'm focused, as opposed to this, as if I actually really do this. I will hit a well-flatted ball and land it on the front half of the green, gently rolling it toward the hole. Which thought process or focus do you think will more likely achieve the desired results? It's a no-brainer, but what do we do all day long? Guys, listen to your self-talk. Check your focus. Do you have a picture of success or of failure? Are you trying to achieve or to avoid are you trying to achieve or to avoid? Let's be proactive about our positive focus. Next, playing to win in God's kingdom. So if we agree with Christ that we are to be positive and zealous for victory, and that the currency we use to purchase that victory is our lives as living sacrifices, and that we are to focus on winning rather than not losing, then we will be becoming the disciples he wants us to be. With that in mind, what if we actually took Christ at his word? What if we read the red letters, right? We, you know what I'm talking about. The red letters in the Bible, all of Christ's words. What if we read the red letters in the Bible, trusted them, and really acted on them? Dallas Willard from The Spirit of the Disciplines says, quote, Most problems in contemporary churches can be explained by the fact that members have not yet decided to actually follow Christ. Wow. <laughs> that like takes my breath away. Most problems in contemporary churches, of which we are one, right? We're a contemporary church, can be explained by the fact that members have not yet decided to actually follow Christ. Little good results, this is still quoting Dallas Willard, little good results from churches offering the lordship of Christ as just an option to salvation. 
To present his lordship as an option leaves it squarely in the category of the white wall tires and stereo equipment for the new car. You can do without it. End quote. The model instituted by Christ in the Great Commission was to make disciples, baptizing them, teaching them to obey. That's the Great Commission. The Christian church of the first century resulted from following this growth plan. Make disciples, baptizing them, teaching them to obey. With great results, I might add, an understatement, the early church. According to Willard, he goes on to say, quote, historical drift has substituted the Great Commission with, quote, make converts to a particular faith and baptize them into church membership. Willard says this causes two great omissions. Number one, the church is not making disciples like it should. Number two, not having disciples then, we're not teaching them. So just how are we to become disciples then? Be with Christ. Beep. Spend time with him. Learn directly from him. The New Testament disciples spent time day and night learning directly from Jesus. We can do that as well. According to Dallas Willard, we can, quote, systematically and progressively rearrange our affairs to that end. Those of you who have heard me speak before, you know that for me says, create the environment for your success. Systematically and progressively rearrange our affairs to that end. To what end? What am I talking about? To what end? Learn directly from him. Spend time with him. Systematically, progressively rearrange our affairs to that end. What does our calendar look like? What's our task list look like? Where is he in it? How much is he in it? That means we have the ability and the opportunity to prioritize our lives, our time, to be with and learn from Christ if we choose to. What's nice about being a disciple of Christ is the duplication aspect it creates. When we live as disciples, it will be obvious to every thoughtful person around us. Do you agree? I've severely beat you into submission now, haven't I? You're afraid to say anything. When we live as disciples, it will be obvious to every thoughtful person around us. Do you agree? We read in the Bible metaphors like wrestling with God, striving for the great prize, running the race, fighting with strong enemies. These are not descriptions of passive involvement in God's kingdom. These are descriptions of zealously fighting to be disciples. Jonathan Edwards, again, said, quote, The exercising of the will is nothing other than the affections of our soul. A person who has a knowledge of doctrine and theology only without religious affection, I'm going to explain this in a second, has never engaged in true religion. Now, this guy was writing in the 18th century. Nothing is more apparent than this. Our religion takes root within us only as deep as our affections attract it. Now, let me define one word. Affection, which means, at that time, a disposition or a state of mind. Okay, affect, A-F-F-E-C-T. So now let me read this a little bit differently. The exercising of the will is nothing other than the state of our soul. A person who has a knowledge of doctrine and theology only, without religious state of mind, has never engaged in true religion. Nothing is more apparent than this. Our religion takes root within us only as deep as our state of mind attracts it. In other words, our actions come from our true beliefs. We can't hide that. We cannot hide that. We can talk all day long about what we believe. Doesn't matter. What is our behavior? How do we act? We do what we are, and we are what we do, not what we say. Question, as others watch our actions, who would they say we are? 
Are we actually representing Christ as we claim we are? And there's a cost to being a disciple of Christ, right? Everyone know that? Everyone who's attempting to be? Let's look at the cost of discipleship and what we get if we choose not to pay the price to be a disciple. The cost of discipleship and non-discipleship. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote about the cost of discipleship. Bonhoeffer discusses, discusses cheap grace and easy Christianity. Oh, man, we're right thick in the middle of easy Christianity here, aren't we? Who here would agree that being a Christian, however, is not easy? Being a Christian is not easy. We are called to make difficult decisions every single day on small things that we might want to just say, oh, it's just a little thing. Don't worry about it. Right? Don't make a mountain out of a molehill. Bonhoeffer points out that one cannot be a disciple of Christ without forfeiting things that are normally sought in our human lives. He gets us. And to quote Willard again, quote, that one who pays little in the world's coinage to bear Christ's name has reason to wonder where he or she stands with God. One who pays little in the world's coinage to bear Christ's name has reason to wonder where he or she stands with God. We better be sure where we stand. These two scholars of Christianity clarify for us an uncomfortable consideration, which should cause each of us to ask ourselves, am I really a disciple? Am I really? Or am I just playing around? What is discipleship costing me? If I'm practicing easy Christianity, then where do I really stand with God? Because we know our true beliefs show up in our actions. We cannot get away from it. Can't hide it. These are uncomfortable questions, aren't they? But they need to be answered by each of us individually. And while discipleship is costly, non-discipleship is far more costly. Willard goes on to say, quote, non-discipleship costs a biting peace. It costs a life penetrated throughout by love. This is non-discipleship. This is playing around at it. It costs a faith that sees everything in the light of God's overriding governance for good. I want that. It costs hopefulness that stands firm in the most discouraging of circumstances. I really want that. (laughs) Because there are a lot of discouraging circumstances out there. It costs power to do what is right and withstand the power of evil. I really, really want that. In short, It costs exactly that abundance of life Jesus came to bring us. He gives us this gift, and so many times we refuse to accept it or unwrap it. But it's there. We see that if we fool ourselves and try to take a shortcut to discipleship, we actually end up far worse than if we really played to win. Give up the good for the great. As it goes, here's this really scary part. As it goes with the individual, so it goes with the church also. When the church is made up of individuals playing not to lose, the church as a whole suffers. Look at what Robert Greenleaf, author of Servant Leadership, says about the enemy of a healthy organization. This is the enemy of a healthy church. Who is the enemy? To quote Robert Greenleaf. Who is the enemy of a better society and the paths to reaching it? Not evil people. Not stupid people. Not apathetic people. The healthy society, like the healthy body, is not the one that has taken the most medicine. It's the one in which the internal health-building forces are in the best shape. You get that? Healthy individuals. The real enemy is fuzzy thinking on the part of good, intelligent, vital people, and their failure to lead and to follow servants as leaders. Too many settle for being critics 
and experts. Still quoting Robert Greenleaf, so yell at him. Too many settle for being critics and experts, sitting on the bench, right? Armchair coaches. In short, the enemy is strong, natural servants who have the potential to lead, but do not lead, or who choose to follow a non-servant. They suffer. Society suffers. And so may it be in the future. We, however, are a healthy organization only when we who are each a part of the organization are zealously pursuing spiritual health through discipleship. For the organization to be healthy, we need to be healthy. The leadership will not create health. Individuals create health. And if that statement scares you, let's end today with one of the hundreds and hundreds of promises of God, which is 1 Corinthians 15, 57. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. When it all comes down to it, well, yes, we have responsibility. Yes, we are how we behave, what our actions are. But we have him in us and with us, and he will not let us fail. God will save the day if we let him. Amen. Thank you, wherever that came from. With him, all things are possible. All right. As the band comes back, let's look at some next steps. Knowing what we now know about playing to win, as opposed to not playing not to lose, or as opposed to playing not to lose. In order to play for win, to win for God, commit this day. I hope you guys are fidgety right now. And you don't like me. <laughs> In order to play to win, commit this day to God. Right there. Love God. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven 37 says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Number one. Love God. Get to know him better as his disciple. Rearrange your affairs so that we're spending time with him on an individual basis. It's not that difficult. And if it is difficult, all the better, right? All the better. Love others. Number two, love others. Hebrews 10.25, love others. And let us not neglect our meeting together. He knows how important it is for us to live in community. As Let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do. But encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Man, we need to, we need to hang together, people, every day. Grow in the Lord along with other Christians on a regular basis. I will make a, a commitment somewhere around here, or ask me. I'll give you my cell phone number. You can call me anytime. Anytime. We need to live together. Okay? Things stink. You don't think God is about to save the day? You need somebody to just listen? Call me, call anyone. We need to live together. Thirdly, first, love God. Second, love others. Thirdly, serve. Matthew 25, 35 to 36. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. What's the point? Do something. Just do something. For him, regularly. Do something for him, regularly. Okay, let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, the past three weeks we've learned that we need to be on your team. If someone here is not on your team, Lord, I pray 
that they would seek someone out, me, Pastor Ron, someone else here after the service to find out how to be on your team and what that means. And as we accept your gift of salvation, we become heirs of Christ and he becomes our Lord. We also learn that we need you as our coach. We cannot do this alone. Help us each to become more zealous for the things of your kingdom. Help us to run the race to win, Lord. Help us to focus on the positive that you have laid out for us and not to be anxious during the trials. 